It is indeed a great privilege for me to give the opening lecture at this symposium honouring Cathy Wilkes. My main credentials for doing so arise from seminars that were held in Balliol College in the University of Oxford during the 1980s on the explanation of animal and human behaviour. And those seminars arose from a long-standing collaboration between another Balliol philosopher, Alan Montefiore, and me as a biological and medical scientist. And as a consequence of those seminars, we eventually both edited um, a book, Goals, No Goals and Own Goals, that resulted from the seminars with Cathy Wilkes uh, and David McFarland, an animal behavioural psychologist, as co-organisers. Alan has given me his description of the way the debate um, developed, and I think he's totally correct when he says that there was mostly an axis between Cathy and um, David on one hand and Alan and me on the other hand. It didn't, therefore, just divide, as it were, philosophers against scientists. And this outcome is itself very significant. Because, as I say, the divide was not really one between scientists and philosophers, and it shows also that scientists themselves um, are not neutral with respect to the philosophical concepts concerning animal and human behaviour. I want to note there were two other contributors to this book, Sean Lockery, now a distinguished neuroscientist in the United States, and Dan Dinnett, who needs no introduction, very famous philosopher in the United States, who also contributed to the book. But a further professional link with Cathy arose from the book she edited with Bill Newton Smith, yet another Balliol philosopher, uh, called Modelling the Mind. She and I both contributed chapters to that book. Cathy herself wrote the chapter that gave the book its title, Modelling the Mind, while I followed some of the arguments in the Goals book with a chapter on biological explanation and intentional behaviour. So I want to begin this introduction to Cathy's contributions to those philosophical discussions and debates by asking what was the philosophical and scientific background that led somebody like me, a medical scientist, to be interested in the philosophical debates. And that arose from a published interaction in 1967 with Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher, did his thesis in Oxford, um, following the production from his thesis of the book, The Explanation of Behaviour. And I was introduced to the book by Anthony Kenny, with whom I've interacted ever since on issues to do with mind, will and action. Arising out of our discussions, he encouraged me to write a critique of Taylor's book in the journal Analysis, arguing that Taylor's defence of teleological explanation was incorrect in the sense that it seemed to require a difference in state at one higher level to do with behaviour, should not necessarily have a correlate at another lower physiological level. On this view, there would be a gap in the mapping. And as a physiologist, at that time certainly, I found the idea of such a gap very difficult to accept. Taylor did, however, reply to my criticism of his book with a very interesting argument. This was that while he agreed that there could not be a physical gap, it might nevertheless be the case that after studying a whole series of correlations between, say, behaviour and neural states, only the higher level of explanation would count as an explanation, specifically if the behaviour states are B1, B2, B3 and so on, and the neural event states E1, E2, E3, the E states might just be so disordered with respect to explaining 
the behaviour, whereas the B states might offer a ready explanation. We'll see echoes of this when I come to analyse Cathy's contributions. Anyway, I found this a very interesting reply, and I countered that the consequence was that the issue of the validity of teleological explanation then became a conceptual issue, not an empirical one. Now, I believe that was a very important clarification, and I think it's still partly correct. And if in discussion people want to take me up on the question, why the partly, I'll be very happy to do so. But I also think that the debates anyway have moved on very significantly since 1967, and those seminars in Balliol College, in which Cathy was such a major contributor, formed an important stage in that development. Now, during those seminars, I was still developing the ideas on goal-directed behaviour that eventually became expressed in my books, The Music of Life and Dance to the Tune of Life, and in a very long series of articles. Those publications aimed to describe the ways in which teleological behaviour naturally occurs and develops during the evolutionary process. More recently, I've taken those arguments and evidence further in an article written jointly with my neuroscientist brother, Ray Noble, to show how behaviour itself contributes to the evolution of the species, and so gives evolution a kind of directionality. Not a new idea, incidentally. Charles Darwin, no less, also had the same idea. Um, a paper that is just about to appear in the Biological Journal of the Linnaean Society, which is where Darwin first elaborated his idea of natural selection, follows that idea up even further. And I'll come back to those contributions and how they flowed from some of Cathy's ideas at the end of the talk. However, in the 1980s, I was far from ready during those Balliol seminars to give expression to those ideas. And it is in retrospect that I can see only the roots of my own development. Now, that is unfortunate from one point of view, because I think that if I'd been able to express those ideas and marshal the biological experimental evidence more forcefully in the 1980s, perhaps the debates could have taken a different turn. But the flip side of that coin is that I remain deeply grateful to Cathy herself and to the other participants for a sustained and deeply stimulating series of seminars that did much to clarify my own thinking. I would have loved to be able to try out some of my recent ideas on Cathy herself, particularly because, as I will show in the talk, I believe they answer one of the key questions she contributed to the debates in the Goals book. First of all, though, I want to give you a little vignette of how some of my scientific colleagues reacted to the book itself, and particularly to Cathy's contributions, because soon after the publication of the Goals book in 1989, I sent a copy to the distinguished zoologist and expert on the intelligent behaviour of the cephalopods, J. Z. Young. I had been taught medical sciences in University College London, where J. Z. Young was the professor of anatomy and a world-renowned expert on the learning and behavioural repertoires of the octopus. Actually, I suspect I learned more philosophy from him than anatomy. So I thought it would be a good idea to get his reactions to the book. And he wrote to me afterwards to say that he'd enjoyed reading it. In fact, he said, I hope he was right, that he'd read it several times. But he wasn't exactly complimentary so far as my own contributions were concerned. Um, so much for Alan and my side of the debate. And I'll come on to the reasons why that might be the case in a moment. But J. Z. Young was much more complimentary about Cathy's chapters, which he thought were clear and, in his view, largely correct. So I want to ask the question, why was a great um, biologist like J.Z. Young working on intelligent behaviour in the cephalopods um, sympathetic to our debate at all and to Cathy's contributions in particular? Now, to understand that, 
we need to recall that J. Z. Young was the discoverer of the giant nerve axon in the squid that enables it to produce a form of jet propulsion, in turn enabling it to flee uh, predators successfully. Incidentally, this was also the giant nerve axon on which Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley worked to obtain experimental data on which they constructed their famous model of the nerve impulse and its dependence upon sodium and potassium ion channels in the axon membrane. When they were awarded the Nobel Prize for this work in 1963, Young was known to have commented, well, this is a bit like awarding the prize to the typewriter rather than to the author. Now, I don't think he meant to denigrate Hodgkin and Huxley's achievement. Rather, I think he was pointing out that the reason for the existence of the giant axon, its purpose, was precisely the evolutionary imperative to generate a rapid response to predators. And he saw that this uh, was the emergence during evolution of a goal-directed mechanism. The fast-conducting axon was simply the physical means by which the response was so uh, rapid because large axons conduct impulses vastly faster than small axons. That was indeed an important prediction of the Hodgkin-Huxley nerve model. He therefore regarded the mathematical analysis of the mechanism of the nerve impulse to be simply far too low a level to explain the goal directedness um, of the behaviour. Um, that certainly was exactly Taylor's argument too, and with which I'm sure Hodgkin and Huxley would have readily agreed. So, Jay Z. Young was certainly sympathetic to the general purpose of the Goals book. Low level explanations don't work, and for precisely the reason that emerged from my interaction with Charles Taylor. So, why specifically did Jay Z. Young think more of what Cathy wrote than what Alan and I wrote? Now, I suspect that that was due to the fact that he was nevertheless, like nearly all scientists at that time investigating behaviour, suspicious of teleological ways of speaking about animal behaviour. We were taught as students this famous statement attributed to J.B.S. Haldane, the great evolutionary biologist, um, but I think it comes from somebody else even earlier. Teleology is like a mistress to a biologist. He cannot live without her, but he is damned if he's going to be willing to see, um, uh, be seen with her in public. <laughs> in fact, at that time, some biologists, um, I think this was the, the French team involved in uh, some of the early days of, of genetics, uh, Mono and Jacob, um, they even invented the word teleonomy to refer to biological processes involved without committing to whether or not an organism is an agent. I'm not quite sure that I understand how one can have purpose without agency, but that might be one of the issues we want to take up in discussion. I certainly now think there was absolutely no need to invent a separate word. Organisms are necessarily agents. But this is not the place to justify that point. Here it suffices, I think, to say that it is a tribute, and this is my main point on this part of my talk, it is a tribute to Cathy's work that such a noted expert on animal behaviour as Jay Z. Young um, thought highly of it. So, what were her main points in the girl's book? Well, she wrote two chapters in the book, and she explains her philosophical position most clearly at the end of the second, and I quote, Our discussions of these issues over several years have left me more confused at the end than I was at the beginning. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and then he continues, I have suggested that many of the problems might be pseudo-problems, to be dissolved rather than solved, and certainly... I line myself with the theft over honest toil school philosophers who prefer problem dissolution to problem solution. Nevertheless, she identified, and this is important, one question that has emerged as an indissoluble, crucial and critical question, what counts as realism in psychology? And her comment on that was this needs serious thought, which would and should enrich and deepen the ongoing examination of realism, even in the physical sciences. And on this, surely she was right. 
There is now a veritable flood of books on what is real, the matter with things, and so many other similar titles. And as I will show towards the end of my talk, there are good reasons for this explosion of interest because there is a groundswell of opinion in opposition to the confidently expressed reductionist certainties of the 20th century. Cassie herself, it seems to me, from reading her contributions to that book, was more concerned with what the common, as it were, man in the street might want as an explanation. She wrote, not all explanations are causal explanations. If one job of explanation is to remove puzzlement, then evidently people can be puzzled with, by well-nigh anything. Here she is talking very much in the tradition of philosophy paying attention to the language and problems of the man in the street. I found it helpful during the seminars that she was continually bringing us back to the pragmatic uses of philosophy. And it is this aspect of her philosophical work that I suspect was at one with her engagement uh, with the problems of the world, notably here in the immense contributions already referred to um, that she made to the intellectual life of Dubrovnik and of Prague. There are others at this symposium who know far more than me about that aspect of Cathy. My knowledge is largely second-hand through um, my collaborators Bill Newton-Smith and Anthony Kenny, who both lectured to the undercover seminars held in Prague. In a recent email to me, Tony Kenny wrote, and I quote, when the distant Czech philosophers first made contact with Western universities, only Oxford made a positive response, and that was due to Cathy, who at that time was the secretary of the philosophy, philosophy, philosophy sub-faculty. I think that she, Bill Newton-Smith, and I, this is Tony Kenny writing, of course, were the only people to be arrested for talking to the Tomin group. But it was she who went on lecturing even after being arrested. Nancy, that's uh, Tony's wife, and I were just taken off to the police station, extradited early the following day, to the surprise of the German frontier police who assumed that we were just drug smugglers. Well, time and again, as we've already seen in the comments at the beginning of this symposium, Cathy was more concerned with pragmatics than with grand theory, of which seems to me she was highly sceptical. And I think, by contrast, Alan and I must have seemed to her to be rather too strongly concerned with conceptual theory. And it is in this vein um, that I discovered this quote about what she thought about whether science could or could not find correlates of intentions. She writes in the book, common sense psychology needn't bother about whether these intentions are explicit and real or tacit and hence not really there in any strong sense. In other words, when we ascribe intentions to an agent, we're not usually committing ourselves to the existence of a physical correlate of that very intention. And I suspect this is why she and David McFarland often joined forces. David, as an experimental psychologist, was very sceptical of whether intentions ma matter at all. If I understand him correctly, um, these were feelings we experienced which need not have any influence on how we actually behave. Here, though, I want to put in a qualification, because Cathy herself was not a Watsonian behaviorist. In fact, she explicitly explains that. She says, and I quote again, extreme Watsonian behaviorism failed because there is so much that it just cannot explain. And she continues, this is scarcely surprising. It was always a priori implausible that so simple-minded a theory could account for the most complex system we know. But it, that is behaviorism, rejected all mental terms. Here, I'm only examining the possibility that a scientific theory might do without one of them, that is, intentions. A strong feature of Cathy's contributions to the debate was her continual insistence on clarifying what we mean by an explanation. She writes, what sort of accounting for do we want the traditional goal concept to provide? In this book, we find free uses of causes, is responsible for, explain, continually guides, and more besides. 
And this leads into the rather more specific question of whether explanation via intentions or goal representations is a species of causal explanation. And that forces one to ask just what is needed if A is to be the cause of B. And then she went on to write, being a cause, serving to explain, and being responsible for are not synonymous expressions. Now, on this issue, Cathy and I were in agreement because we both thought and wrote in the book that whatever intentions might be, they could not be the cause of behavior in the same kind of way in which nerve impulses cause muscle movement. And I think she was on exactly the right lines in insisting that at least different concepts of cause need to be invoked. She wrote... Thus, although endorsing Noble's claim that within an intentional context a machine description of what happens fails to make reference to the most significant facts, I would want to explain why this must be so by linking significance to the precise characterization of the explanandum, to the puzzlement of the inquirer. And she continued, I find it increasingly difficult to find any real-life cases where there is a genuine, honest-to-goodness rivalry at all between intentional and non-intentional explanation of what is needed, um, in what is indeed the one and the same explanandum. These arguments all form part of her attempt to underline the differences between common sense and scientific explanation. Now, I now find myself in total agreement with her argument on these issues, even to the extent that my own recent publications not only elaborate on why intentions cannot be, the, be causes in the same way that nerve impulses can be, but also that even within purely biological levels of organization, the forms of causation are significantly different between the different levels of biology. As an example, causation from the genetic level is mediated by templates, gene sequences, not by specific molecular interactions. DNA does not itself directly um, uh, form proteins. These direct quotes from her work for the Girls' Book will, I hope, give you a flavor, at least, of what Cathy contributed to the seminars and the book. But fortunately, the book itself has just been republished as an e-book by the publisher. So interested people can readily explore uh, further if they wish. Now I want to turn to her contributions to modelling the mind, and I must warn those who've got a printed copy that this part is not in the printed copy. <laughs> um, she begins in that book, um, remember her own um, chapter actually led to the title for the book, Modelling the Mind. Um, she begins by clearly stating that we should never talk about the model. Because even in physics, as she pointed out, and as Nancy Cartwright, another famous philosopher, has pointed out in relation to physics, we need multiple models, even incompatible models, um, for like metaphors, they illuminate different aspects of reality. And they can be useful even if completely incompatible. As Lakoff and Johnson famously said in their book, Metaphors We Live By, metaphors can have good and bad ranges of applicability. As an example, what works for the micro level in physics, that is quantum mechanics, does not cover what the theory of general relativity covers and vice versa. And she writes, the danger as far as psychology is concerned comes when we switch from indefinite to definite article. Yet, the problem is that particular models do nevertheless become dominant. Um, she writes here, Hume's metaphor of the mind as an inner theatre was never more than that, a metaphor, as he was the first to insist, even though it became deeply compelling to treat it as if the mind was indeed really like that. I think this is the sense in which she was appealing for an explanation of the concept of realism in psychology. So, if we cannot think of minds as inner theatres inspected by an unblinking inner eye any longer, just what do we think the mind might be or what it is to be mental? There is then, in her chapter in this book, a careful analysis of the computer model 
of mental processes. And she points to the danger. There's a very real possibility that psychological explanations might bottom out in hardware structure and function long before we have learned anything from the computer metaphor. In fact, that the really interesting work may come rather from one or other of the neurosciences than from simulation exercises. And it's at this point that I find and encounter a very fascinating speculation. She writes, it may be that if we were to construct a computer with capacities close to those of the human brain, we would have to use as structural elements synthetic cells or things that behaved very much like neurons with, say, action potentials, graded potentials, synaptic modifiability, dendritic growth, and so on. This paragraph is, I think, the key to her thought. Because I think it's tantalizingly close to where my own thinking has come recently. Specifically, I have speculated in some of my articles that in order to access the kinds of molecular stochasticity, the jiggling around at the molecular level, and I think we do that, incidentally, in order to access that kind of molecular stochasticity in real brains, we might have to make computers, if we want to call them that, using water rather than silicon. Now, that's only been done once, and that's by evolution over several billion years. Um, the argument is very simple. It is that novelty, creativity in organisms may depend on precisely what kind of stochasticity is harnessed by living organisms. My overall conclusion, therefore, from rereading Cathy's work after about 30 years have passed, is that her contribution, particularly to modelling the mind, is the better example of the depth of her thinking. She was more, as it were, in that book, in full control of what she was writing, instead of being, as I quoted earlier on, more confused at the end than I was at the beginning. Now I come to a mea culpa and the ending of my lecture. I suspect that one of the reasons for that conclusion on her part in the Gold's book is a fault of my own as a biologist in the debates, because perhaps something was missing from what I, as the physiologist in those debates, should have been contributing. So what was missing in the 1980s? Well, on my part, it's actually very easy to explain. Like most biological scientists in the mid and late 20th century, we were all still under the sway of a seminal book written in 1943 by the great quantum mechanics pioneer Erwin Schrödinger called What is Life? I call it a seminal book because it led directly to the central dogma of molecular biology in the work of Watson and Crick. Both of those acknowledged Schrödinger because he made two predictions in his book that were apparently to find their confirmations in the work of Watson and Crick. The first was the genetic material when discovered, it was not known in 1942 to be DNA, but that when it was discovered it would be found to be what he called an aperiodic crystal. And if you think of a linear polymer as a kind of crystal, a bit of an extension of the idea of a crystal, I agree. Um, then the description aperiodic is a good one. It is precisely that characteristic that enables the molecule to encode so much information. So far, so good. But the second prediction of Schrödinger to be taken up by the molecular biologists simply cannot be true. He argued that if one sees the genetic material as an information-dense sequence, how is it read to enable the characteristics of an organism to be transmitted from one generation to another. Because a one-dimensional sequence cannot simply map a three-dimensional structure. It is not a miniature organism in the way in which some 19th century microscopists thought and imagined when they looked at sperm and egg cells. Could that three-dimensional template come from somewhere else, perhaps in the three-dimensional structure of the cell itself, which is, of course, inherited? So not a crazy idea at all. 
Whichever way that is done, Schrödinger re reasoned that the sequence must be read in a determinate way if it was to faithfully transmit information to the next generation. Stoch stochasticity in a communication line is intolerable. And from this he concluded that there must be an absolutely fundamental difference between physics and biology. Physics can be characterized as order from disorder. There's the jiggling around of the individual molecules at one level, but of course the ordered um, array of uh, equations of quantum mechanics at a higher level. And at the micro level, there's also the essential stochasticity of quantum mechanics. And even if one day an alternative view of reality is produced, as people like Albert Einstein and David Bohm believed, we can't escape the fact the equations of quantum mechanics are precisely predictive as probabilistic descriptions. Now, that is not difficult to imagine, since we already have an example of stochasticity at the molecular level that was discovered well before quantum mechanics. In 1827, Robert Brown found that fine particles derived from pollen grains showed stochastic movement in water under the microscope. We call it Brownian motion, and it was shown by Einstein in 1905 to arise from the random bombardment of the particles by the random motion of water molecules. Yet, the equations of thermodynamics, as I said earlier, describe large numbers of particles, and that's how they generate the gas laws, and those are determinate. Well, the answer to this apparent paradox is that if the motion at the particle level is genuinely random, then large numbers of particles will just cancel their individual movements out to produce a constant pressure when heating, hitting an object. Order at large scale, therefore, arises from disorder at lower scales. But that interpretation, which I think is obvious, is incompatible with a Schrodinger review of biology, which Watson and Crick took over, in which the genetic material at the molecular level is supposed to be read in a determinate manner, rather as an X-ray beam can generate an accurate and determinate picture of a crystal. Biology, he reasoned, therefore, was the generation of order at large scale from order at the micro scale. But you've got to read Schrodinger carefully. On page 101 of that little book, he admits, we seem to arrive at the ridiculous conclusion that the clue to the understanding of life is that it's based on a pure mechanism, a clockwork. And he continues, the conclusion is not ridiculous and is, in my opinion, not entirely wrong. But it has to be taken with a very big grain of salt. And he then explains the big grain of salt by showing that even clockwork is, after all, statistical. There is a little bit of jiggling around in the mechanism. I'll give him, give him that. But my reading of the last pages of Schrodinger's book is that he's confused. He realizes that something is not quite right, but he's struggling to identify what it might be. And this confusion has muddied the waters of science ever since, and for about 80 years. And it's the reason why it's impossible, or has been impossible, I think, to marry together uh, what seems like straightforward determinate science with uh, the investigation of purpose in organisms. Why is it wrong? Well, we would now say that the molecules involved, that is DNA, are subject to major statistical variation. There are copying errors, chemical and radiation damage errors, which are then corrected by the protein machinery in living cells that enables DNA to be a highly reproducible molecule. And that's a very, very complex process. As far as we know, it can only occur in living cells. The order at the molecular scale, therefore, that Schrodinger was appealing to is therefore actually imposed by the system as a whole, by the higher levels of biological organization. This requires energy, of course, which Schrodinger called negative entropy. Perhaps, therefore, this is what Schrodinger was struggling towards, but we can only see this more clearly in retrospect. He could not have known how much the genetic molecular material experiences stochasticity and is constrained to be highly reproducible by the organism itself. 
So, Schrodinger's idea that led to the central dogma cannot be correct, and I can't underline that point more strongly. It also led to the incorrect read-only view of DNA. It's really a read-write system. Now, why is this important, the debates on teleology? And here's where I try to round my lecture off by bringing it back to where Cathy got us to in her speculation that it might be necessary to actually reproduce neurons to make a living organism as a kind of computer. Why then is this important to the debates on teleology? Well, one answer is that the central dogma should no longer be used to justify a closed, determinate nature to biological processes. Because just like everything else that depends on the motion of molecules, there is massive stochasticity at the lowest levels. Only at the higher levels can there be order that a genuine explanation of behavior requires. Furthermore, it is precisely through the constraints that the higher order imposes on the level, lower level stochasticity that we can develop a multi-level theory that privileges the higher level. That is the purpose of the uh, second of my recent book, books, uh, Dance to the Tune of Life. Those constraints ensure that there is an asymmetry between the causal force of explanation at higher and lower levels. This echoes Cathy's idea that intentions cannot be causes in the way that nerve impulses are. The higher level is genuinely causative, though, in another sense, because it is only from that level that one can understand the constraints and how they arise. This is the sense in which I think that Charles Taylor's conceptualist view of teleology is correct, and how I think it now be given a firm biological science basis. Furthermore, it is possible to show, and that's what I've tried to do in my recent articles, that this necessarily excludes the one-way reductionist causal explanation of organism behavior. The complete argument is technical, and there's no time for me to go through it properly here. But the overall conclusions are straightforward, and I can summarize them in just three short, short statements. First, when we examine the mathematics of multi-level causation, which is encapsulated in what I call the principle of biological relativity, it is impossible to dispense with the influence of the higher levels on the lower level behavior. Impossible in the sense that there would be no solution to the equations involved in the models we might construct. That is a mathematical necessity in any living system with multiple levels of organization. Second, that organisms use lower level stochasticity to generate their characteristic innovative activity in finding solutions to the challenges of survival. Our immune systems are doing that all the time, and they do it by changing the organism's DNA. There is, again, the breaking of the central dogma. That's done in a tar targeted way. And thirdly, Harnessing of stochasticity occurs in the functioning of the nervous system. Massive stochasticity at the molecular and synaptic levels in the nervous system. So that also may contribute to the physiological processes that underlie innovative behavior. Because it is at one and the same time both stochastic, we can't necessarily predict a Beethoven or an Einstein, yet we can un see it under, as understandable in retrospect. We can judge the reasons and values that must have guided what has done. I personally think, therefore, that one aspect of the debate that Cathy was so deeply involved in in the 1980s with me, Alan Montefiore, and others, is now closed, in the sense that higher level explanations must have a validity because we cannot dispense with the influences of higher levels on lower level behavior. And that is, as I've said already, a mathematical necessity in multi-level organization. So I want to conclude this talk by noting that the issues on which Cathy uh, made so many important contributions 30 years ago are still very much live issues today if I've succeeded in moving the debate on somewhat recently, I owe a lot to her insights and great contributions. And I finish this tribute to Cathy with a kind of coda. Because 
Nearly 20 years ago, in August 2003, I was contacted by Alan Montefiore, then living in London, to ask whether I could possibly go to the John Radcliffe Hospital to visit Cathy Wilkes, who was unwell. This, Paul, must have been slightly after your meeting with her that you described so well earlier. Indeed, I went, and Cathy was very much unwell. I was trained as a medical scientist, although I have never treated patients. But I was saddened to see all the signs of a hopeless clinical situation. Cathy, though, immediately recognised me, and we briefly discussed her work. Her mind was clearly focused on Croatia and what happened here in Dubrovnik, because sharp as a knife, she reacted immediately to my mistake in referring to Yugoslavia, which is what your country was when I first visited in 1965. I immediately tried to correct what I said, but she was firm and insistent, Croatia. And I think what I believe may have been her last words were, I am a fighter, I never give up. She was. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dennis. That was uh, very rich, very illuminating.